So I'd like to begin this evening by asking you all a question. And that question is, when do you think women were first recorded playing football in Scotland? Do we have any brave souls who want to hazard a guess? 1920s. 1920s is a great guess. 1880s. 1880s. Yep, someone at the back. 1600s. Yeah, close. So the answer is actually, and hopefully this will surprise many of you, 1628 is the first recording that we have. So if women have been playing football for so long, why do we know so little about it? Before we get into exploring the history of the game in Scotland, I'd like to talk a little bit about the historiography, who has actually researched this and why this is a question that hasn't really been addressed. So the situation in England is by far the most developed area of academic research um, in the area of women's football. And it developed significantly in recent years with multiple areas being analysed, including the professionalisation of the women's game, player experiences and club histories. Interestingly, this research has been conducted not only by academics, but also by those interested in the game for personal reasons. For example, my colleague Steve Bolton has been inspired to perform really intricate, in-depth research as a result of a family connection to an early women's team. While Dr Gary James has done a lot of research around the Manchester area and the development of women's football there. The works of James, Melling, Williams and Bolton have moved our understanding of the development of the early women's game on immeasurably. However, this is problematic as the focus has been almost exclusively on England, which has often been assumed to be representative of the experience across the UK and Ireland. Of course, it's not just the history of women's football which has been skewed in favour of an English perspective. But it is marked in this particular case, and it is problematic. Perhaps that focus has been placed, placed on events in England because of the significance of the Football Association. It is the oldest football association in the world, and it led the way in formalising the rules and regulations of the game. Therefore, perhaps scholars were right to assume that its role in the formation of women's football was central not just to England. Perhaps it was a more practical side to this bias, the location of the researchers themselves, or the availability of primary source materials within the UK. Each of these are plausible explanations. However, emerging works in Wales, Ireland and Scotland, and even regional studies within England in recent years, have started to highlight the complexities of the women's game and its difficult development. I have argued elsewhere with colleagues that it's vital that we explore these regional developments in order to produce a more nuanced understanding of women's early game. It's important for historians to revisit the established or the accepted historiography and to interrogate it from different perspectives or when new material emerges. So why Scotland? Academic studies of the women's game in Scotland have focused almost exclusively on the contemporary <coughs> game. Exceptions to this are the works of Macbeth, McQuaig, Macmillan, Fraser and my own research. Early studies, those of Macbeth and McQuaig, provided the first academic critiques of the game and its development for women in Scotland. But given their limited sources available to them at the time, and also the breadth of the studies that they were conducting, they were only able to provide an initial overview of the game in its first hundred years. More recent studies, such as those by Dr Karen Fraser, have added greatly to our understanding of the game from the mid 20th century onwards. And she's done this by drawing on oral histories of players and organisers of the game. The, the findings of that research, alongside outside archival material that she's gathered, have been donated to the National Football Museum and form the basis of the first collection around women's football. In doing so, they have provided a depth of understanding of the lived experience of players and organisers and an insight into the game that is not possible for the early period that I'm particularly concerned with. And so there has remained a significant gap in our understanding of the women's game between the 1890s and the 1960s. One of the reasons for this gap is because of the lack of, this, of primary source material. There is no one archive where this material has been collected together. Most of the men's clubs that exist didn't have women's clubs affiliated to it for reasons that I'll go on to explain. So there's no obvious place to look. Similarly, the Football Museum hasn't collected material over the years because, again, women's football 
wasn't particularly valued, people haven't preserved those archives. And it's only really in the last two to five years that the digitization of local newspapers have made it possible for us to start to piece together and map the development of women's football. And the reason for that is, these are the only sources where the women's game are recorded, but they're not recorded in a systematic way. So nowadays when we buy a newspaper, we want to learn about sport, we turn to the back pages. It was similar in the Victorian era and the early 20th century. However, women's sport was very rarely covered in the sports pages. It was more often put in the kind of entertainment and gossip sections, which makes it much harder as a researcher to find these tiny snippets of information. So digitization has been a real gift. And the origins of this research that I'm, uh, that I'm currently doing came about uh, as part of COVID when I was looking for something I could work on from home. Um, and I realized that these sources have been digitized. But of course, digitization brings its own problems. Not every newspaper has been digitized. Not complete runs of newspapers have been digitized, so there are significant gaps. And sometimes digitization is of one particular area. So there might be a Scottish version of one paper and an English version of the same paper, but it's the English version that gets digitized. So again, we have problems around that, uh, who is being digitized, what is being digitized. So it's not unproblematic. But nonetheless, it has allowed me to uncover the stories of women footballers and start to share their stories and their narratives. And that's what I'm going to do this evening. So we heard about those early, uh, those early footballers. There's a very long history um, in Scotland of women's football, and a, a history I feel we should be proud of. As I mentioned, the earliest records of women playing football were recorded in 1628, when a minister recorded his frustration at his parishioners breaking the Sabbath by indolent, insolent behaviour of men and women footballing, dancing, and taking part in barley breaks. Again, women playing football is mentioned in 1795, this time by Reverend Dr. Alexander Carlyle in the statistical account for the parish of Inveresk, when he noted that the fishwives, we can see a picture of them here, do the work of men. Their manners are masculine and their strength and activity is equal to their work. Their amusements are of a more masculine kind. On holidays, they frequently uh, play golf and on Shrove Tuesday, there is a standing match at football where the married and unmarried women at which the former are always the victors. It's been suggested that the fact that the married women always won means that this wasn't really a competitive game. It was kind of a given. It was set up who was going to win. It was part of the fun of the holidays. But nonetheless, the fact that these women were playing and were doing so publicly, I would argue, is significant. It's not really until the Victorian era that we start to see the emergence of the modern women's game of football. So taking place just seven years after the first men's international between Scotland and England, and in a period where the relatively young football association was still locked in a bitter war with its rivals trying to establish a common set of basic rules for the game, this match took place. Now I should say, for those of you that aren't football historians, Scotland had a really important role in the formation of association football, the men's game. Um, and this is something that's been uh, explored by a group called the Hamden Collection. So if you're interested in finding out more, Google the Hamden Collection and you'll find out all about what we contributed, the Scottish nation contributed to world football and the Scotch professors. Um, but nonetheless, against this backdrop, we are also leading the way in terms of women's football. And the first match happened um, here in Scotland, not that far from here at um, Hibernian's ground. We can see the air advertiser, and don't worry, I'm going to pick out a few quotes from this very lengthy quote uh, for you. They framed this match, this international match, as little more than a curio, a kind of entertainment, a kind of fashion show or a freak show. They noted that most spectators um, went to the match and took it less than seriously. Quote, they were pretty free with their criticisms, not only of the play, but of the appearance and the behaviour of the players, treating the various episodes and accidents of the game with sarcastic or personal remarks and with loud guffaws. The general feeling seemed to be that the whole affair was an unfeminine exhibition, end quote. The organiser of that game was Helen Matthew, pictured here. She was a Scottish suffragist 
and yet her name doesn't actually appear on the team sheet for that match. She and many of her fellow players, we believe, used pseudonyms. And that was to protect their true identities. And the reason for that was very simple. Despite the apparent sort of benign initial curiosity of the press and the public, in the late 19th century, it wasn't really safe or seemly for women to play football under their own names. It was so far beyond the realm of acceptable ideas of womanhood and femininity at the time, it was quite scandalous. A week after that debut match in Edinburgh, the teams took to the field in Glasgow for a return match against England. And in that span of just seven days, public opinion appears to have turned against the women footballers. On the morning of Friday the 20th of May, 1881, provincial newspapers across Britain carried reports of that match. Under the headline, Ladies International Football Match, the Nottinghamshire Guardian informed its readers. What will probably be the first and last exhibition of a female football match in Glasgow took place on Monday evening at Shawfield Grounds. The meagre training of the teams did not occur much for proficiency of play, and if the display of football tactics was of a sorry description, it was only what might have been expected and not much worse than some of the efforts of our noted football clubs. So far, so positive. Um, however, the crowd initially subjected the players to faintly body banter, as we'd seen at that very first match. But then, in a precursor to modern soccer hooliganism, in the 55th minute, the match rivalry turned to violence. And we have another quote. At last, a few roughs broke into the enclosure. And as these were followed by hundreds soon after, the players were roughly jostled and had prematurely to take refuge in the omnibus which had conveyed them to the ground. Their troubles were not, however, yet ended, for the crowd tore up the stakes that had marked out the pitch and threw them at the departing vehicle. But for the presence of the police, some bodily injury to the females might have occurred. The team of four grey horses pulling the omnibus was driven rapidly from the ground amid the jeers of the crowd and the players escaped with, let us hope, nothing worse than a serious fright." End quote. A third match had been scheduled in Ayrshire, However, local magistrates intervened and said that it was just too scandalous to allow it to go ahead. And so instead, Helen Matthew took her team of players um, over the border and set up a series of games in Blackburn, Liverpool and Manchester. But she quickly came across similar opposition there too. So in a matter of just a few weeks, the modern game of women's football in Scotland had been born and had been crushed by public opinion. There were few further attempts to stage the women's games and the sport would essentially disappear for another 14 years. When it did re-emerge, when it did re-emerge in 1895, it was in the form of the British Ladies Football Club pictured here. And once again, it quickly foundered on the rocks of prejudice and misogyny. Their first match in Scotland was played at St Mirren's Ground in Paisley on the 1st of May 1895 in front of 6,000 spectators. The ladies were attired in, quote, blue knickerblockers, uh, some also having skirts to their knees. The play from commencement to finish was the occasion of continuous and hearty laughter. The match was described by a journalist in the Paisley and Renfrewshire Gazette as, quote, the most ridiculous exhibition I have ever seen in my life. Despite clear public interest, or at least curiosity, crowds of several thousand watched many of these games. Positive public opinion was sorely lacking, and matches were once again blighted by riots and protesters. And indeed, that first game in Paisley ended with the players being escorted by the police back to the pavilion after the crowds broke onto the pitch. Before long, the second attempt to establish women's football in Scotland had been abandoned until the outbreak of the First World War, when things changed quite significantly. <clears throat> so as a generation of young men signed up to serve king and country, so too did the women that were left behind. They answered the call and hundreds and thousands, uh, sorry, with hundreds of thousands taking on traditional male roles that had previously been considered too dangerous for women. The most familiar image of these were the munitions factory girls, and we can see them pictured in the background of, of that text. The female workers converged upon the various factories that sprang up around the country, forming strong friendships on the factory floor that spilled over into their leisure time and sports in their breaks. 
informal kickabouts became a popular pastime for women, and this was not missed by factory management. An activity that was previously considered unsuitable for the delicate female frame was now heartily encouraged as good for health, well-being and morale. It undermined trade unions and could accommodate without much specialist equipment or facilities within the factory setting. As the war progressed, the women's game became more formalised, with fo um, <clears throat> football teams emerging from the munitions factories. Initially, the novelty of women playing football was used to raise money for war charities, with crowds flocking to see the so-called munitionettes take on teams of injured soldiers or women from other factories. Um, I should also say that very first slide that I had on, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed there were quite a lot of men in drag at the back, on the back <laughs> row of that slide. I, I'll maybe put it up at the end. Um, and the reason for that was because there weren't a lot of women's teams for these initial uh, players to play against, sometimes they would play against men. But it wasn't fair to simply allow able-bodied men to play against women. That was you know, beyond the pale even within these circumstances. So they would dress up in drag or they would in some way disable the men. So they would tie a hand behind their back or they might blindfold the goalie in some way. Um, and so that, that very first image kind of is a nod to that. Um, however, as we move on in the war, once we get further into 1917 and into 1918, teams emerge from across Scotland, from the main war work factories such as East Riggs in Gretna, Beardmore's in Glasgow, and war work factories in Arbroath, and the National Filling Factory at Georgetown in Renfrewshire. Um, and we can see that this is something that's been picked up almost immediately by the press. So the Dundee People's Journal noted, some of our female munition workers are becoming keen devotees of football. Our Magdalen Green, where several of them can be seen nightly playing vigorously, attired in the garb which has become so familiar in the case of females since the outbreak of war. Some of them are very adept at the game and can dodge their male opponents with remarkable dexterity. Similarly, the Georgetown Gazette, which was the in-house magazine for the munitions factory, the Scottish filling factory, um, the latest development in the social life of the SFF, the Scottish Filling Factory, at the Georgetown, is the Georgetown Girls Football Club. Its inception is due to the parkhead workers of Messrs Beardmores issuing a challenge to our factory to play them at their sports. Georgetown has never yet shown the white feather and although we possess no football team, the challenge was at once accepted by our girls with enthusiasm. Preliminary practice has begun, and from all reports, we have no doubt our team will give a good account of itself. And indeed, they did. So far, I have managed to map over 60 games taking place during the duration of the First World War. Many were often part of wider sports days for workplaces um, and events. Uh, they often took place in football stadiums, such as Ibrox and Dens Park, um, rather than being standalone football matches, at least initially. Where matches were part of a wider event, it's impossible to say what crowd attendance um, was actually like. But what we can say is that many of these all-day sports events would attract between 10 and 15,000 visitors. So it's likely that large numbers of people were watching women playing football. For example, the National Projectile Factory Sports Day at Fir Park in 1917 attracted approximately 17,000 people through the gate. And it was noted in reports that a large crowd came to watch the game between the Mile End Factory ladies team and the Moss End Works ladies factory team. So it was actually singled out as being a highlight of the day. In later years of the war, once we get really into 1918, I would say, we start to see teams playing more regular matches and often holding events in their own right. So they would have standalone matches. So why did they play? What was it that changed that made it more acceptable? I think this quote indicates one of those reasons. Um, this is an article from the Daily Mirror. Drill, music, dancing and games are what our munition girls need to make them efficient, said Mrs Yeaman of the Ministry of Munitions. Um, after 12 hours work and hours travel to and from home, girls in Woolwich were as keen as mustard on gymnasium, swimming and football, and it made them fight the fine workers that they are. Mrs Yeaman, who has had more than three years' experience in munitions works, including supervising and police work, is an expert scholar, angler, and holds 25 medals for swimming feats. So she's arguing, and many other um, people involved in factory work at this time, that 
in order to keep women fit and healthy and in fact to enhance their health and their physical abilities within the factory setting, encouraging them to do sports was a really good way of doing that. So it not only got them fit and healthy, built up their muscles and their strength, but it also encouraged them to work as part of a team. Um, and so it was a really positive thing. There's also an argument that it undermined trade unionism. It gave them something to do in their breaks that was something that was um, quite structured. Uh, rather than just you know, standing around smoking and chatting and so forth. So again, it was something that was actively encouraged by the employers in this period. Similarly, they are playing for charity, and I think that's absolutely key. So the, establishments, the establishment of teams starting to play regularly from 1918 onwards. And a really good example of this is around their growth area. And this surprised me. When I started this project, I thought I would find teams playing in and around Glasgow and Edinburgh, but actually I also found quite an active um, number of teams in our growth. Um, so there are teams forming in different local mills, so the Alma Mill, Nursery Mill, and in factories like, like Keith and Blackman's and the Montefith Foundry. Um, so these teams became established, the public and the media alike started to enjoy the matches for the skill and the ability of the women rather than seeing them as a humorous spectacle. And we see that in the way that the matches are reported in the press. Games are consistently promoted as being solely for the purpose of raising money for war charities. And I would argue that it is this use of charity, combined with the topsy-turvy circumstances of the war, which allowed women to place football in this period without criticism or intimidation. Indeed, the latter uh, standalone matches Crowds are recorded as indicating between 1,000 and 2,000 people coming along to watch these women playing. So really significant numbers of people coming just to watch football. We can see from these images here, these are actually quite unusual, particularly um, the one on the right-hand side where they're actually playing football. It's unusual to see images of women playing sports, actually actively playing sports. Most images you'll see in the press are static, partly because of the technology harder to capture the moving body, um, but also harder to make someone look very feminine when they're playing a game like football. Whereas if you've got them all standing and looking pretty and smiling and their hair is perfect, it's much easier to sell that way. So this is quite unusual that we see this active image here. Um, so both of these teams are playing, they're munitions workers, and they're both playing um, for charity. Uh, the picture on the right is from an international women's match that's played at Celtic Park between English Vickers Factory and the Scottish Beardmore's Factory in March 1918. And I'd say that's probably the most famous um, Scottish match of that period. And it actually attracted a crowd of 15,000 people coming to see these women playing. So it really was quite a standout event. So what was happening in England, just to give you a, a taste of, of over the border, there's a very similar pattern emerging. Leading the way were Dick Kerr's ladies from um, Preston who were founded in 1917 out of a war work factory, and their first match drew a crowd of 10,000 people. Now, Dick Hares are probably the most well-known women's team of this era, and rightly so. They were groundbreaking in a number of ways, but probably most important is that they were sustained. So they started in 1917, and they went through till the 1960s. So they actually lasted a very long time, and they travelled all over um, Scotland. They travelled in England, but they also travelled to France and to America as well. So they were you know, a truly international uh, side in that sense. By 1920, in a Boxing Day match held against St Helens Ladies, was watched by 40,000 plus spectators at Goodison Park. And I say plus because that is an area of huge contention amongst historians, particularly of Dick Carers, about how many people were actually there. We don't know because often in this era, people were, um, it was hard to, to restrict who was getting into the ground. People were being lifted over stands, people were climbing over fences. Um, so it was much harder to kind of get exact figures. And um, so there's a lot of debate around that, but we know it was a huge figure and that that record really stood for a very long time to, until very recently, actually. Um, unusually, their success continued um, well beyond the war. And as I've mentioned, um, took in you know, Scotland as well as international tours. But there was a post-war backlash. One by one, the factories returned to normal work 
and the women who had been galvanised and liberated during wartime found themselves being quietly shunted back into domestic life, returned to their, quote, right and proper place in society, and encouraged to take up the jobs that they had held before the war. So there was a significant backlash against women generally in society, but specifically in relation to football. And we can see some of the quotes here. Um, so Dr Mary Schwarlib of Harley Street um, was quoted quite a lot, quite extensively in the press as saying that there was no health benefit for women playing football. And in fact, it really was very unsuitable for women. It was quite dangerous. Um, Dean uh, of Durham, Bishop Weldon, also chimed in saying that uh, women can enjoy all exercise, which is so desirable for their health and their character. Um, and this does not, in his opinion, include football, um, because he's worried that women who do play football will lose something of their refinement, which is womanhood's particular grace. My hope is, therefore, that they will, in their own interest, choose other games of a less violent nature. So we're starting to see people saying in public, this really isn't on. We need to go back to women playing uh, feminine sports, taking a step back from football. And in fact, the FA in England take it a step further. And in 1921, they bring in a ban. Now, I'd just like to show you, before I go into the details of that ban, an example of a Pathé uh, newsreel where uh, it shows you women playing football. So you get a sense of what we're talking about. And this was specifically in relation to the ban. So this is a silent film, so please don't worry that there's no <laughs> sound. Um, I just I wanted to show you that to give you a flavour of what these women looked like, the kind of football they were playing, and the way that their uh, playing was framed by the media. So in terms of pushback against women, the biggest push came in December 1921, when the FA passed a resolution requesting that football clubs refuse the use of their grounds for women footballers as they considered the game unsuitable for females. And um, a quote from the actual document uh, itself, complaints have also been made as to the conditions under which some of the matches have been arranged and played and the appropriation of the receipts to other than charitable um, objects. The council are further of the opinion that an excessive proportion of the receipts are absorbed in expenses and an inadequate percentage devoted to charitable objects. For these reasons, the council requests clubs belonging to the association to refuse the use of their grounds for such matches. So essentially the rationale they're putting forward for this ban was to protect women from themselves, that football was too dangerous for them physically, um, and also ironically, I think, that they claimed that the women's game was corrupt. Um, there's very little evidence to support that it was corrupt. Um, however, these were the two justifications that were put forward. What this ban meant in a practical sense was that women were no long, longer able to access pitches and referees that they had used successfully during the war and that their participation was now stigmatised. It was now seen as something that was less than desirable. In Scotland, um, we don't have a formal ban um, until the 1940s. I'd argue we have something slightly more insidious um, we have a kind of informal ban where the women's game is not encouraged. So the SFA are less than supportive of the women's game in this era. Um, and they face a lot of hostility and public criticism for trying to play in this period. However, many women did continue to pursue the game after the First World War. Um, so we can see here some of the, the quotes from the, the local press. They are just saying... Essentially, this was okay under war conditions, but now we're kind of back to normal. Um, it's time that, that we sort of take our sport back as well. And this idea that um, 
women's football will kind of die a natural death because it really was just something that happened during the war. But there were women who went against this. So Dumfries Ladies uh, was formed in 1921 and given their location and the date that they emerged um, not long after the First World War, it's reasonable to surmise that they may have had links to the vast munitions complex at East Riggs and that these were the women who were playing in their teams that have, have come together to form this. We can see from this table that, um, and I should acknowledge here my colleague uh, Steve uh, Bolton, who helped me with this part of the research, um, that they had a really interesting relationship with Dick Kerr's ladies who would come up from Preston to play, and that this would attract quite significant crowds. So we can see the numbers, um, estimated numbers for the crowds there. You know, we're talking four or five thousand people coming to watch them playing. Unfortunately, <laughs> Dumfries ladies were not as good as Dick Kerr's, and we can see that they conceded 41 goals um, in four games, and they scored none. Um, so they didn't do particularly well, but what they did do very successfully was raise a great deal of money for charity because of the numbers that were coming uh, to see them play. A team, by contrast, who was incredibly successful and incredibly skilled um, was Rutherglen FC. So the Rutherglen case study that I'm going to go into a bit of detail about was conducted by myself with my colleague uh, Steve Bolton that I mentioned earlier. So these are, I would argue, the foremost team in interwar Scotland. Some of their story was known locally within the Rutherglen area. Rutherglen is a, a small town just on the outskirts of Glasgow, actually very near where I was born. Um, and thanks to Dorothy Connor, who was the granddaughter of the team's manager, J.H. Kelly, um, within this community, this story was quite well known. Um, but some of the details were hazy, and beyond that, it really wasn't known, and it's been omitted from the history books. Families of the players themselves often did not know of their connection with the team. And one of the most rewarding aspects of this project for Steve and I has been getting to meet the descendants of the players and sharing our findings with them. So this is a team that deserves to be known and that their stories deserve to be celebrated. They played over 80 games between 1921 and 1932. The team was made up of young working class girls, some of them as young as 13. And they were established and run by the manager J.H. Kelly, who began life as a miner, then he worked in the music halls, and then a touring music troupe pre-First World War. Um, he was a very entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial guy. Um, in the post-ban years, um, one of the greatest challenges that faced a women's team was who would they play? Um, High-profile matches played by Rutherglen in 1921 show that serious games against men's teams were regularly played, we can see an example of it here. Um, most mixed football over the years has been treated by the media with disdain because it fell squarely into the definition of kind of folk football or informal football. Um, and we can see that uh, in this particular image, we have a young Sadie Smith taking a, a, a kick at goal here, but the goalie has his arms tied behind his back. Um, I think it's also worth noting in this image the tartan shorts you can just make out. That was really quite iconic for the Rutherglen team. Um, so Rutherglen did play against men to begin with, but more often they played against other women's teams. Um, the men that they played against were Blackridge men's, Longcroft ex-servicemen, some junior sides, and some um, a disabled um, or uh, people who'd been injured during the war who were recovering at local hospitals as well, they would have kind of matches there. Um, but the team did play against other opposition, but it was hard to find quality opposition. And so um, one way around this was that J.H. Kelly developed a B-side that he would travel with, so there was always opposition. In 1923, Rutherglen continued to play against men's sides, but at least six of their games were played against the cinema girls. Games were closely contested affairs and they were played in locations like Lanark, Kilsyth, Linlithgow, Bells Hill and Carluk. All locations within 10 to 30 mile radius of Rutherglen and most were on a dry, direct train service. And this suggests that they weren't travelling too far for games, games that could be played and then travel back to their home, uh, their hometown so they could go to work the next day. Um, they would change um, considerably as we'll see from the map I'm going to show you next. Media reporting of these games was generally very positive, and in at least one game, they attracted a crowd of 2,000 spectators. 
So Rutherglen played all over Scotland. We can see from this map some of the places they travel through, which again, if you think of the era and how difficult it is for them to actually get around Scotland and the fact that these are working women as well, they're having to take time off their work to, to do this, um, it is really quite significant, I think, that they are travelling all over. They also played against English sides, Hayes Ladies um, and Dick Cares. The match against Dick Cares was hugely significant for Rutherglen. Dick Cares were well established and impressive. They were known as the world champions because of their skillful play and their reputation for confidently always beating their opponents. But in 1923, Rutherglen did the unthinkable and beat Dick Cares. And as a result, J.H. Kelly, entrepreneurial to the end, rebranded his team World Champions. Um, a significant and effective marketing move that was guaranteed to pull in those crowds. The teams played well and coverage of their matches in the press was very positive, often comparing the players to male players of the time. So for example, Alan Morton, who was a, an internationalist in this period, played for Rangers. One of the stars of the team, Sadie Smith, that we saw on the earlier slide, was regularly singled out for her spectacular skills and Sadie was compared to Alan Morton. What's really interesting is that Sadie became the captain of the team, but she wasn't the only celebrity in her family. Her granddaughter is the singer-songwriter, singer Eddie Reader. And as part of our research, we made contact with Eddie and we made a documentary with her about Sadie. Um, so the other thing that's significant, and I think possibly astonishing about Rutherglen is that they were also able to tour to Ireland twice in 1927 and 1928. So far, we've been able to uncover nine games in Ireland in 1927. The first at Gibson Park in Belfast, where approximately 8,000 people came to watch the proceedings, with a significant gate of £130 being collected. Rutherglen won 6-1 with a fine, display, a fine display given by the winners outside left. And this was followed by games at Carrick Fergus, Larn, Ballyclare, Ballymena, and Bangor. The games were billed as Rutherglen versus Edinburgh, suggesting that J.H. Kelly had taken two teams on tour to ensure a good show for the crowds. The reception for the teams was one of mixed curiosity. Quote, Scotland's game, uh, sorry, Saturday's game was between two ladies' teams and something of a novelty. Like all other members of the fair sex, they took advantage of their prerogative of turning up after the scheduled time. But mere males are accustomed to this kind of thing. Rutherglen, centre forward and outside left, appeared to have grasped a few of the rudiments of the game, but as for the remainder, well, it was good fun watching them. While another noted that a game was much more of an entertainment than, a, than exciting in character. Often the reports um, noted that this was the first ladies' match to happen in a particular district, with only one stating that matches had happened um, during the First World War in Ireland. So the significance of this tour really can't be underestimated. On Saturday the 21st of May, a truly unique game took place in Milltown in Dublin, where a crowd of 12,000 watched a game that was billed as Ireland versus Scotland. Scotland won eight or nine goals, depending which report you believe, against one. Um, the local Dublin side, um, with various reports that Molly Seaton played for Scotland, Rutherglen, and scored most of the goals. Interestingly, the final three games were billed as Scotland-Ireland, so he shifted his marketing from Edinburgh, um, uh, Edinburgh Rutherglen to Scotland-Ireland. Um, and the th reason we think that is because he started to kind of bring in some Irish players as well to kind of legitimately call it Ireland. Um, so the London Sentinel noted that it was the first of its kind in the city and the ladies acquitted themselves like men and some excellent football was witnessed. Some newspapers uh, questioned just how Irish the Irish team was um, and indeed it's likely that many of those players um, that were playing in the, were actually the Edinburgh team from earlier. As the Derry Journal noted, the enterprising Scot, J.H. Kelly, saw big money in the challenge matches between the Irish and the Scottish lady footballers. And accordingly, two teams of lasses from the Land of Cakes set out on what can only be dubbed a professional tour. This was really the pinnacle of Rutherglen ladies. Um, they did bring some of the teams back to Scotland and they toured as Ireland and Scotland in 1927. And then they tried to recreate that magic in 28, but things kind of went disastrously wrong. Um, and from that point on, the team declined. A lot of the players, as I mentioned earlier, were very young. So we got to this point where they're all starting to get married and go off and, and have children. And in fact, that's exactly what happened with um, Sadie Smith. Um, 
she got married and she started a family and so she gave up playing football very early on. And I think what's really interesting was um, when we were uncovering this story and we were talking to Eddie about it, she didn't know that her granny was a footballer. And she said, do you know, it's, it sort of makes sense because my uncle recalls playing football in the back close of the tenement and some guy hanging over a wall and saying, oh, you're good, son, but you're not as good as your ma. <laughs> and that story never really made sense until we were able to sit down with Eddie and show her all these clippings. You can see her, that's her granny there in that, that slide with Molly Seaton. Um, so it, none of that made sense until we were able to show her all these things and all these wonderful quotes about, about her granny. So if you are um, interested in finding out more about the Rutherglen ladies, if you look on iPlayer, you should find Sadie Smith, the documentary, where we kind of trace that story. So what happened next? So in the final few minutes, I just want to kind of summarise um, what happened very briefly afterwards, just to, to give you a sense of, of closure. <laughs> Um, so, as we move into the, the late 20th century, um, there are a number of things that happen. Um, the SFA become a bit more draconian about women's football, and in 1948, you see a formal ban being put into place, so it becomes much more problematic for women to access facilities in Scotland, although I would argue it had always been difficult from uh, 21 onwards. Um, in 1971, um, things in England were moving at a pace and they had established um, a, a women's association. In Scotland, they had formed a women's association, but the ban is still in place. Women are not allowed to uh, formally play football. But in 1971, UEFA instruct their members, they sent out a questionnaire and they said, is the women's game growing in your area? Is there interest? Should we be supporting it? And 31 of their members, uh, member associations came back and said yes, absolutely, and one said no. So they held a vote and 31 voted in favour of lifting any bans or obstacles that were in place. The only nation that said no was Scotland. So we have this really odd situation that from 71 onwards, all of these bans are being lifted all over, um, all over Europe, but not in Scotland. So we have the first international match played between England and Scotland after the bans had been lifted in England in 1972 at Ravens Creek. Um, but the team is still illegal or banned. Um, and so they have to kind of cobble together all sorts of provy loans and things in order to fund the team to get strips. They're sewing on badges and all sorts of things um, to go down and play this match. Um, so it's really difficult. 1974, eventually the SFA lift the ban. But really, we think that came about because Equalities Acts were coming in through Westminster, so it kind of forced their hand. It wasn't because they suddenly saw the light. Um, so they, they lifted the ban in 74. But we have this really peculiar situation where the women who represented Scotland in international matches, even once the ban was lifted, so from 72 through to, uh, I think it's 95, none of them were given caps for representing their country. And so that's something that I have been working on along with um, Andy Mitchell, who's in the audience, um, and my colleague, Karen Fraser. We've been working with the SFA to trace the women who played in these matches, to trace which matches would fall within certain boundaries and categories in order to get recognition for them to get caps. And so I'm really proud to say that recently um, we were able to bring together the team from 1972, those that are still surviving, sadly some of them are no longer with us, we were able to bring them together at an international match at Hamden and give them their caps and take them out onto the pitch and get that recognition from the fans that they deserve, which has been brilliant. Um, it's also been challenging because a lot of the women have been like, too little, too late, nobody wanted to recognise us at the time, and we've been trying to say, no, it's really important that you get this recognition, what you've done is, is really important. So. It was wonderful, it was very emotional. Some of these players hadn't seen each other for decades, so actually bringing them all together has been fantastic. And since then we've had one other CAP event um, and we're planning more in the future as we trace women. And we're also trying to find the families of women that are no longer with us so that they can come and receive uh, the CAPs posthumously. So I think it's really important we celebrate these women because they pushed the boundaries, they carried on playing in the face of lots of you know, adversity and barriers. Um, and I think they're fantastic role models for the young women and uh, girls that are currently taking up the sport. 
Um, so, to conclude, um, I would argue that the development of football in Scotland for women has been a case of one step forward and two steps back. It's not been a kind of easy, straightforward um, improvement. Women have faced hostility to their participation in football um, in a way that's not mirrored in other sports of the period. Um, and I think that's something that has continued, although I, maybe the tide is now turning and it's becoming more popular and more acceptable for women to play football and for us to support them playing football. It is an emerging area of research, so as I said right at the start, there are lots of gaps, there are lots of things we need to find out. I would encourage all of you to do research in this area if it interests you, because you know, there's lots of space for us all to explore this. And it's a really active area, there's lots of people doing this, so it's, it's a great community to be part of. If you'd like to know more, um, there is an exhibition about Rutherglen Ladies FC that is touring Scotland. Um, I think it's currently in, Kink in Kirkcaldy. Um, there's a documentary about Sadie Smith on iPlayer that pops up periodically. Um, there's also going to be a panel um, about uh, women's football at the Paisley Book Festival uh, coming up next month. And shameless plug, I'm also writing a book with Karen Fraser that will come out at the end of the year, hopefully. And if you're interested, please do drop me a line on Twitter or email if you've got questions or you want to know more about other things that we're all working on. Thank you. Thank you.